Hello, everybody, and welcome to this month's Future in Space Hangout. My name is Tony Darnell from DeepAstronomy.com, and man, we got another really great hangout plan for you today. We're going to be talking with members of the Planets Foundation, which is a consortium of astronomers and uh, institutions from around the world who have dedicated themselves to understanding the techniques and uh, the building the equipment necessary to search for life in the universe. Now, very modest goal uh, that we are, I personally am very excited to uh, learn more about. So we're going to hear about that from, we have members of the group of the, of the foundation here today to tell us what they're doing and how they're going to go about it. Uh, but before I do, let me introduce my good friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Harley Thronson from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Hi, Harley. How are you doing this week? Good afternoon. I'm doing, doing great. It's a, a beautiful early fall day in the mid-Atlantic Everybody should have a day like today. It's gorgeous. Yes, it's also nice down here in Florida, but it's okay, nice we've got a we've got a, a a great group. I've been looking forward to for several weeks hearing all about this consortium. Yes, good. Well, we will get hopefully uh, satisfy your curiosity today. So, um, but but and I'm going to introduce them just momentarily. But before I do, let me tell you, we this is a hangout. We are live right now. We definitely want you to interact with us. And there's two ways main ways you can do it. The best ways are by going to deepastronomy.com slash live, which you see right there. And I have my chat client open and running. And already we have Kevin and Stephen P and George Caldwell, all of them uh, set up for uh, talking with us, uh, uh, chatting online. So join us and ask your questions and comments there. Also on Twitter, I've got uh, my future in space hangout hashtag all set up and ready to go. So you can also tweet at us using future in space. So without any further ado, let me go ahead and get started and introduce my guest. So with me, uh, joining me today is uh, our members of the Planets Consortium. I'll start with Dr. Svetlana Berdug uh, Ber Berdugina. Uh, she's from the Kuypenheimer Institute for Solar Physics. Also joining me is Dr. Mar Mar uh, Maude uh, Langlois uh, from the University of it's Lyon, right? Not Lion. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. Uh, also, uh, so welcome, folks. And, um, Thank so, you. So, Thanks a lot. Yeah, it's good to have you. So the, I've if you've watched these Hangouts at all, uh, any length of time, you know that I have said many, many times that we live in a golden age of astronomy. And in no other way, our area of science has this been more dramatic than in the study of exoplanets and I mean this was a field that didn't even exist 20 years ago and and now we know when we've learned just a few years ago that we now live in a galaxy where there are more planets in it than there are stars and that fact alone folks ought to humble you if that doesn't humble you I don't know what does because that to me is a very astounding fact that there are more planets out there then there are stars. And we've got techniques for finding these things. We've talked about the radial velocity method. We've talked about the transit method, which Kepler uses. And so these are all techniques that are pretty tried and true, but I think we're gonna learn about, about some new ones here today to not only detect planets, but to actually image these things. And so um, the future, I mean, you've also heard about SETI and our, that's our current uh, search for extraterrestrial intelligence uh, uh, driver right now they're out they've been doing a search for for many many years now uh, and that search is still ongoing but it's time to look ahead what's going what's coming down the pike we know that with the transiting exoplanet survey satellite being launched in August of next year that's coming up folks uh, we're gonna be looking for planets uh, all over the sky um, and the, the there's, there's also W first coming further even further down the pike in the 2020s and so all of these things are coming up but the and these will help us understand the nature of planets in our galaxy um, but I'm interested to hear so I'm, I'm going to start with you Svetlana tell us a little bit about what the Planets Foundation was designed to do and then I want to Go, I want to look at some of these really cool telescopes that you guys have on the drawing board. So go ahead. So Svetlana, tell us a little bit about what the Planets Foundation is and what you're hoping to do. Sure. Uh, we are a bunch of scientists and engineers, a group from different countries, actually right now six countries. It's uh, Germany, France, Brazil, United States, Mexico. Uh, we come together, we bring our own expertise, uh, everybody brings what, what they are. I am a specialist in pol polarization of light, so I use polarization, polarization for, of light. 
yet. So that is, uh, we can discuss in detail. And sure. uh, many of us uh, actually fascinated about this technique because it opens a new dimension in the light analysis. You say uh, we detect planets through radial velocities. For that, we detect spectra. For, through transit, we d detect uh, change in the flux of the st uh, stellar flux. That's so right. when we talk about polarization, it's completely new dimension. And as usual, if you look at the new dimension, you find new information. And we all in Planet Foundation excited about it. And we build telescopes to uh, combine the advantage of polarization and the uh, uh, advantage of optical design to increase the contrast of detection of the planet to the star. You may have discussed this also in your uh, handouts that planets are extremely faint and they're usually next to extremely bright stars and it's very challenging to detect directly and transit and radio velocities these are indirect detection of planets we are here in planets foundation we want to detect planets directly and this is where actually image the planets themselves that's what you're talking about exactly and um image in a sense you know you can use imaging word in astronomy in different ways you can say image a planetary system in the sense just to see a planet as a dot or there are also techniques we can discuss today image the planet in the sense that you can see what is on the surface in that kind of imaging so you can talk about imaging star and planet next to each other that's the image of two uh, point like sources or uh, other technique we also develop is to see what is exactly on the planet so um, I worked many years on, on uh, to see what exactly on the stars, like star spots, imaging of star spots. And that's a similar technique now we can apply for planets to see what is on planets. Okay, I want to ask you about that in just, of, in just a minute, right. but I, because that, that comment right there really piqued my interest, but I want to know how you did that. But before we do, so the Planets Foundation is, is interested in trying to use new techniques to not only just detect planets, detecting planets is passe right now. We want to see them and we want to see what's on them directly. Uh, is that right. what you're saying? We want to see atmospheres, yes, we want to see surfaces, we want to see biosignatures, we want to see life there. And as our one of our co-founders, uh, he said, I want to see how waves on oceans of other planets break on the shore. Oh, you know? is that all? Something okay, like cool. That. All right. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> this is what motivates us. That was, he said, that I just want to see those waves breaking on the shore of other planets. <laughs> and of, and uh, then we said, how can we do that? And we said, okay, maybe we build Colossus Telescope. This is how Colossus Telescope came around. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, so Dr. Maud Maud Langlois, let me let me get you in this a little bit. Um, so, what is your what do you what are your what is your role in the Planets Foundation? Uh, and can you give us also some idea of what kind of time scale we're talking about? And then I want to show the telescopes. Okay, so uh, I'm more uh, involved in developing high contrast technique for so for direct detection, as uh, mentioned by uh, Svetlana. So these techniques basically. Uh, are de dedicated to remove the, the starlight, which blur uh, the image and enable to enable you to, to get to the planet itself. But also the atmosphere is a big problem. So you need a, to have a, a system which is called adaptive optics that compensate in real time the aberration that are produced by the atmosphere. So all these techniques, so coronography to block the starlight and adaptive optics are, are all required if you want to isolate uh, the, the light for, from the planet itself to get its photon uh, with even large telescopes. So these techniques are already um, uh, working on smaller telescopes and I'm involved in the Sphere instrument which is on an 8 meter telescope in Paranal. And That's right, the Sphere instrument, we've talked okay. about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So which is really dedicated to target uh, uh, like very massive, so um, more than several uh, Jupiter mass planets close to uh, uh, nearby and uh, young uh, uh, association where we actually see planets but also disks so we see surroundings with the planet and planet formation making uh, making uh, basically uh, tracing tracing material in the disk this kind of things start to be uh, detected but for planets that are uh, quite far um, in the system with uh, Colossus we aim at 
uh, terrestrial planet and even getting more information, uh, being able to take spectra and, and uh, very accurate polarimetry to get to understand exactly uh, what, what is on, on these uh, planets. Okay, now because, so because the, the, the light, reflected light from a, any planets that may be in orbit around a star is so much dimmer than the star itself, Maud, you're saying that we've got to find a way, and and other people have doing are working on this as well with with and I believe it's also a part of the James Webb Space Telescope of blocking out that star's light. And the and you're calling it cor 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 coronography, I guess is the that's a tongue yeah. twister, so it's <laughs> which blocks out the star's light and leaves the reflected light of the planets visible, right? And that's something you're interested in as well as. Removing the effects of the atmosphere. Now, whenever you've looked up at the sky, the reason stars twinkle, folks, is the light coming in through the atmosphere is being uh, distorted by that atmosphere. And if you've ever gone out on a hot summer day and then gone out at night and the stars twinkle just a little bit more because the atmosphere is very turbulent. So Maud's talking about removing that effect entirely using something called adaptive optics. And that is something we'll talk a little bit more about as the, as the thing progresses, but let's talk, so, <laughs> wow. So we wanna image planets directly. We wanna see what's on them. We wanna separate out this light from the star uh, so that we can see the planets. And we wanna remove the effects of the atmosphere. So presumably these are not space telescopes. These are ground-based telescopes. And Kevin has a picture of one on his window right now. I've got that up right now. It's called, what? What is this telescope that I'm looking at here? This is uh, we called Exo Life Finder Elf. Exo is, Exo Life Finder. Yes, Exo Life Finder Elf. Elf. And this is like a inter, intermediate size uh, Colossus telescope. This is a Colossus would have a dish of uh, like filled in almost filled in aperture with uh, many segments, uh, round segments, big mirrors, eight meter mirrors, and and this is the. Uh, a ring of uh, mirrors of about five six meter in diameter uh, on a ring which makes it 30 20 meters in, in total yeah so that uh, instrument uh, is designed for exactly particularly for this uh, task to see faint planets next to the bright stars in a very narrow field so that um, uh, allows to improve the um, uh, re, uh, to improve this the scattered light problem, and uh, basically uh, uh, that reducing of the field of view uh, uh, allows to reduce the cost of this telescope. There are some several technologies involved into that. We want lighter mirrors, you know, and that reduces the mass of the telescope, and then it reduces uh, also the size of uh, reduce the cost of it. So that telescope, we believe, can be built for, say, 50 million, uh, maximum 100 million, so like between 50 and 100 million, for 50 million, probably five uh, meter mirrors. And uh, this telescope can be used for imaging Proxima Centauri and several other um, exoplanets in the solar neighborhood. Oh, wow. So these, so each one of these individual rings, let me pull it up here on, on my window so I can, I can point at it here. Uh, mm -hmm. Here it is. So I'm going to just share on my thing. So uh, each of these, um, each of these little thing, rings around here or mirrors are about, would you say five meters across? Yeah, five, six. It depends on the cost, how much you want to spend on this telescope. It can be five or six meters. This would give you the size of 20 to 30 meters uh, resolution and uh, collecting area between 20 to 25 meters. So this would act as a 30 meter telescope, roughly? Uh, yeah, okay. roughly, yes. As if far as resolution is concerned. If it's six meters in diameter, this will be collecting area about 30 meters, yes. Okay. So that brings up an important point, folks. Whenever we're talking about resolving things in a telescope, and that means actually they're talking when they when they want to see a planet, resolve a planet, which means see the disk of the planet and see the features on that planet, you're, you're, you're calling that resolving it. And to do that properly, well, the only you've got it, it is a direct function of the diameter of the telescope. How much light that you can co uh, collect will determine how what area you can resolve and what kind of thing you can resolve. So if we're talking about things like, you said Proxima, it would resolve Proxima Centauri, is that what you said, Svetlana? No, no, there is no, a little no. confusion here. Oh. We resolve the planet from a star uh, that, at a just, point like source. 
we separate the two. Yeah, the two, the yeah, the two bodies would be separate, but they still yeah. would look like points. You yeah. will, okay. so that's a you will never. Res- okay, so that yeah. resolving is just resolving the point sources. Exactly. Proxima, uh, the star, the planet to Proxima is very uh, close. It's uh, only thirty million uh, arc seconds, like thirty-seven million arc seconds. You need the telescope bigger than eight uh, eight meters to resolve it really properly. Eight meters is really at the limit. So if you take 20 meter, 30 meter telescope, you resolve it really well. It goes further away in angle, uh, and uh, that that uh, that helps to to reduce this uh, stellar glare. Basically, maybe Mod can tell more more about this. Okay. Well, but before we go, let me just uh, interrupt for a second and just remind everybody: if you've just joined, we are talking with members of the Planets Foundation uh, who are interested. in a group of scientists and engineers who are helping us go forward with our search for life in the universe. They have dedicated themselves to this this very worthy goal, and they are telling us a lot about the uh, the, the plans that they have, and I'm talking with Dr. Svetlana Verdugna, as well as Dr. Maud from, uh, uh, from the foundation, who have given us some of the techniques that they're using to find the uh, life on the other life on other planets outside of our solar system, and we just you just showed us this thing called Elf, which I'm going to put up again. It's the Hexo Life Finder. Uh, what other telescopes do you guys have planned? Well, we have the first uh, first our st- first uh, telescope, which is under construction now. It's Planet Telescope. You can pull it up. All it right. consists only of one of one. A mirror it's not seen there it's uh, like in the middle of that picture roughly right around here um, yeah. It, yeah yeah exactly so it's about two meter one meter size class and uh, what is interesting about it it's off axis telescope we have one uh, scientist in our group who unfortunately couldn't take part today in the in this hangout Jeff Kuhn Dr. Jeff Kuhn he designed uh, several off axis telescopes and this is one of the of this yeah, you and can see the light beam coming in here. It's coming in this way and bouncing off of a primary here, then a secondary, and then down into another area down in this way, right? Exactly, yeah. yeah. So uh, maybe Maud can explain further about it. Okay, Maud, what can you tell us? So this, this is your uh, – I, I should back up a little bit and say you guys have broken this search up into different phases, right? You're looking at, at – you're going to be approaching this – problem in a, in a variety of different ways you're going to try and so the planet's telescope is that the first stage yes Why? yeah it, it is the first uh, stage in developing the techniques uh, so bringing these techniques and and would unable to reach uh, 10 to the minus 6 uh, contrast we want to go deeper with a larger uh, bigger telescope and collecting more photons so it will increase the capability by going uh, to large telescope mm-hmm. which is required Okay. So, go ahead. Yeah, for the off-axis telescope, uh, so basically a telescope concentrates the, the light uh, that is coming from the star. It has several different shapes, uh, which is really driven by the shape of the telescope itself. And what happens with off-axis is that you concentrate more the light, uh, leaving a clean uh, surrounding to, to get uh, access to the, the planet. Uh, by itself so it basically increases the contrast and also uh, the surface the optics the optical surface of the primary mirror is smoother so it it tends to really uh, get almost all the light uh, in the in the central part okay so in the same in, in a way that's very similar to what astronomers did with the lisa telescope the uh, laser interferometer space antenna they made a pathfinder telescope a they called it lisa pathfinder and its purpose was to test the technology needed for a bigger uh, effort for the LISA telescope. So could this planet's telescope, guys, could this be kind of considered a pathfinder telescope for finding life elsewhere? Uh, Kind of a technology demonstration. Right. Yes, absolutely. Exactly that. And I I wanted to say, uh, sorry, I want to say that it is pathfinder. Basically, it's one element of ELF. ELF consists of 16 such telescopes. So those uh, ring, ring of mirrors, what you've seen, this is like one mirror is more or less this planet's telescope. When you put 16 of them in the ring, you have uh, this array of telescopes. The interesting thing we didn't mention yet is that 
uh, each that uh, primary mirror here on the ring, you see, has an uh, individual secondary. So this is really a ray of telescopes on one well, Hang mind. on, wait a second. So here, in this big tower-looking thing, are all the secondaries? Yes, there are 16 <laughs> secondaries there. Wow. Yes. That is complicated. Wow. Yes, and Colossus is the next step. It consists of 60, 60. This is 16. All right, let me so, pull that up. Hang on just a sec while, while you're talking about it. Yeah, actually, cool. while, so I've got a question. I got a question for our guests while you're pulling this up. So uh, these look just terrific. So what do you do with the light when you get it um, to your instrument? What instruments are you going to be putting on it? Um, what will you be? What will your analysis be? Okay, hang on. Can we get to that in just a sec, Harley? I, I, that, I'll, I may, I'll make sure we get back to it. But yeah, I'm yeah, like, yeah, we'll guess a chance to mull that one over. No, I'm sure they yeah, got okay. It. And they then, and so let's, yeah, here's here. Let's <laughs> talk about the optics for a brief. Look at this thing. So this thing is in. This is sort of like the elf, only all filled in, right? Yes, this is on this uh, model, particular model, fifty-nine mirrors of eight meter size. 59 um, eight meter telescopes all put into an array like that yes and each one has a secondary so 59 primaries and 59 secondaries this is array of telescopes this is very important and all of them off axis all of them so the planet is just one element and it is a pathfinder and demonstration of technology and uh once we prove uh i mean we we have no doubt it works it's actually under construction already uh, we missed some findings and we'll be greatly thankful if somebody helps us to continue building and finish it so yeah, i want to get to that in just a bit but if you do, i don't know if you guys can see that uh in this broadcast i hope it's coming through but there's a little guy right here little man yeah. right there oh, yeah, yeah. for scale <laughs> little, little, person. little person little person yeah a little person you right see, you can see the uh you can see it some kind of yeah a truck over there at the right. Yes, yes, yeah, there's a like truck here. Size. <laughs> yeah, so, okay, so this is Colossus. This is the end product. This is where you're hoping to get. Okay, so we've got, and this represents the third uh, phase of the uh, of the project. Yes. So getting to Harley's question, which is, okay, so this is how you get to the light. Oh, bef and I just want to ask before I go there, I'm sorry. You guys sent me all of these visuals. Do I have your permission to package them up and make them available to people for download, or are these proprietary? Oh, you can download them. We have them on our web page. Okay, good. So you go to planets.life. You can download these images yourself. I will yes. also zip all these up, put them on a link in the sure. description box after Please this. Please advertise over. us, yes. Yeah, okay. Please I just wanted to add something like <laughs> Okay, good. So I will, and all the visuals that you're going to see will be available uh, for download elsewhere, and I'll put the link later. So Harley was asking a good question. What do you so you got these different configurations for getting light down into the focus? Then what? What sort of instruments? You mentioned polarization. Polarization is a yeah. very important part. These are, are these are I assume they're going to filter out or use polarimeters in some way. Polarimeters, by the way, are these things that look at only the polarized portion of a signal. Uh, yes, you can come. You, it, uh, you can have just polarimeter. So polarimetry by itself, uh, it's analysis of the flux. So you can do, uh, you can combine it with a broadband uh, <coughs> flux measurements, like you do photometry. So it can be photopolarimetry, broadband uh, polarimetry, or you can do spectral polarimetry as well. So you can do high resolution spectral, low resolution spectral. That's taking a spectrum of polarized light, right? Yes, exactly. Because some uh, po uh, spectral features in spectra will be polarized. And we know there will be a signal from water, from oxygen, scattered light in molecular lines will be polarized. And uh, recently we finished the uh, work on photosynthetic signature. It's responsible for photosynthetic absorption will be polarized as well. Mm. And so polarization will help us to increase the contrast to see these features in the uh, atmosphere uh, and on the surface uh, so increase the probability of detection of it and and increase the um, possibility for interpretation basically interpretation is the next step after you get the spectra uh, to see what so, uh, to explain so, what you see yeah so this sounds interesting uh, very extremely interesting so see if i understand this taking advantage of the fact that uh, biosignatures that spectral features that suggest life will be polarized. 
that will significantly increase the detect their detectability. Um, Absolutely. Yes. Non-features non are continuum, that is, where there aren't any features, would not be polarized. Um, yes, so we did laboratory uh, measurements uh, in your uh, photosynthetic organ. Oh, you're breaking up, Stalana. Or is it just me? Yeah, she's breaking up a bit. Okay. Sorry, my, yeah, my Ma, Ma, maybe Maud can pick up. Yeah, sorry, we were we lost we lost a lot of what you said there. Can you? So Harley was commenting on these features that were uh, are, are are identified by being polarized. So yeah, so the measure uh, dynamic samples and including bio uh, for, uh, biological samples, bacteria and plants. And we see the difference, significant difference. There is a graph uh, there. I don't know. It shows green leaf and green sand, uh, which we uh, if Here, you can pull it go. up. Okay, I've got. Is this the one? Um, is, is that the one? Uh, this one is okay, but I wanted the other one. Oh, uh, right, let me see if I can find it. Just okay. one leaf and one uh, and and uh, sand can kind of. Um, so we're going to see. Ah, here we go. This one. I see this one. Is that the one? Uh, yeah, this one. Okay. So this, is, this is the idea here. It uh, shows reflection from a uh, organism. This here is leaf for the, with the photosynthetic biopigments, chlorophyll, and carotenoids, and inorganic material. This is green sand from a uh, big island in Hawaii. It's made of olivine mainly. So olivine is a very common mineral uh, in solar system and everywhere. So we can have green beaches on other planets as well, you know. So, and you can see the spectra is different, and also polarized uh, polarization in the spectral features are different. Mm. So, there is a big difference. If it's green light, okay, you know, you see green sand, what, would you interpret it as a chlorophyll? Probably not, because the spectrum looks different, and polarized spectrum is amazingly uh, strongly polarized in the band where it is absorbing. And that's what we found that uh, biopigments are seen in the polarization very very prominently okay so That's i just want to go i want to i want to go back and just do a quick review here and talk we talk we rephrase some of the things we just talked about to understand the importance of what you're doing for finding life whenever light comes from a source like the sun or or an unpolarized you know an unpolarized source we call it that's just where the little waves are traveling in all different directions and angles that's unpolarized light but a polar yeah. but when that light hits something like the surface of water, for example, or even at the surface of the ground outside and reflects and comes into your eye, that light, it becomes partially polarized, mostly polarized. So reflected light is polarized light. And that just means that it's just light, all of the light is traveling in the same, the waves are traveling in the same up and down direction. And what Svetlana is saying is that when that light from a star is reflected off of things like leaves and this green sand, it's, it's not only polarized, but then if you look at it through a spectrum, that polarized light, you can begin to understand what exactly is it is that reflected that light. And there are certain things that life, certain signatures that you can look for in that light that would be indicative of life. Did I get that right, Svetlana? Did I say it reasonably okay? Absolutely. This is wonderful. Yes. Absolutely. Okay, good. Yeah. So that's the importance of what they're doing here because they you don't want to if just finding planets that's like i said that's been that's been done that's being done by lots of things but what they're talking about here is a completely different ball game and when svetlana said at the top of this hangout about polarization being an entirely new dimension to understanding life in the universe this is what she's talking about L understanding this polarized light and you had a demonstration with a pair of sunglasses if you take if yes. you take a pair so, of sunglasses yeah. <laughs> Yes, like the that. Polaroids, yes. And the light so, from your laptop screen, by the way, is polarized. So to see what yes, we're talking about. So yeah, rotate. I mean, take this polarized light, rotate it like this, and you will see the the green. Uh, the screen almost becomes really dark, and at some points it really disappears, because in the screen we have the liquid liquid molecule. crystal. So long liquid molecule. Which, uh, 
Right. So the yeah, I'm sorry you're cutting out again, but the the light from the 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 molecules from the the LCD screen is coming out polarized, oh, and a polarized it. filter a polarized filter in uh, your sunglasses or in, in an actual polarizer uh, would only allow a certain amount of light at a certain angle to come through. So you can rotate these polarizers and allow that polarized light in depending on the direction that it's coming in, coming from. I'm sorry, Svetlana, I had to fill in because you were cutting out. Um, are you still there? Okay, well, all right. So, so let's move to the topic, Maude, of uh, what you've been doing. The challenge of getting these telescopes to resolve the two point sources as well as removing the atmosphere. How is the adaptive optic system that the Colossus might have or any of these other telescopes might have differ from what they're using say on Mauna Kea right now? Uh, well, they are not so different. They just have a, a, a smaller, uh, well, a larger number of controlling elements. So basically, uh, as, as um, Svetlana said, so for planets, it's a building block for the bigger things, but it's also building blocks for building adaptive optics. So adaptive optics is uh, composed of a deformable mirror, which has a, a given number of actuators. And the more actuator, the finest uh, detail you, you can correct and then the highest contrast you can get. So it's making a, a deformable mirror with a large number of actuators working to correct the fine detail in the atmospheric turbulences that uh, affect the images. So okay. it, the, the aim of this is basically to really concentrate the light of in the starlight, uh, but also the planet light in the, the pattern which is typical from the telescope, but which is very concentrated and it's not affected by the, by the turbulence. If you don't correct, for instance, the turbulence gives you uh, um, an image of the star, which could be, uh, which is the seeing limited image, which, which is maybe uh, at the best time uh, 0 0.3 arc second, but could be more. Here we are talking, uh, reducing that, that, that size to be able to separate the planet from uh, its star uh, okay. just by resolution effect. So are you expecting to get down to diffraction limit or will you always still be uh, uh, seeing limited? No, already uh, telescopes, so uh, dedicated instruments exist in the world. I mentioned Sphere, but in the US there is GPI. Uh, also the Subaru is making effort in, toward that and they reach uh, good quality, which is already beyond uh, the diffraction uh, limit. Oh, great! But, I did not know that. Okay, but hmm. it's not a resol only the resolution problem. If it, you don't concentrate the light in the resolution of the telescope, all the light we concentrate more than ninety-five percent. But the residual five percent spray around, kind of scattered around, and and limits your contrast. So you. Oh, that's a good get... point. I never thought of that. So. With what we're talking about here, guys, is that with, with adaptive optics, and this is something that this really plagues ground-based telescopes and not space telescopes, the, when the light comes through the atmosphere, what Maude's talking about is you got to get rid of that effect, all that waviness, and and, and it's done with, with currently with lasers and mirrors and all kinds of really cool micro-actuators and things like that. But you're saying, Maude, that as you correct for the atmosphere, the act of of going through the atmosphere scatters would you say five percent or so of the light from that signal well, i'm seeing so we call the, the 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 quality of the adaptive optics correction the strail ratio which is the basically the, the ratio? different yeah the strail uh, ratio which is the basically yeah the performance of how energy you concentrate in the diffraction pattern so okay. he, we reach with current telescope 95 percent and that means that 95 percent is really in the, the diffraction pattern and the rest is uh, um, scattered around it and limits the contrast wonderful so okay it, it's a quad quality criteria which is maybe a bit complicated but uh it just no, but it's important I mean, it's important to, to understand what it is you're working on here because it's you got to solve it i mean that's something that you just can't leave Undone. So that's for yeah that's for the adaptive optics part. There are other so the techniques I mentioned involve um, a coronography to remove diffraction. But in addition, we see a speckle of uh, light spreaded around the halo, which also uh, limits uh, very very much the contrast. So there are techniques by uh, uh, doing uh, angular differential imaging or spectral differential imaging to sort out what is speckled from what is a, a planet uh, signal. 
Okay, so the when you, when, when you go to block out the light, the, using these coronagraphs, do is that done? Where is that done in the optical train? Is it done at the image plane, or is it done somewhere between the primary and the secondary? How do you block out these these light? The slide. So it could be at different places. There are several techniques. Technique that could be in the pupil plane, so in an image of the of the primary of the telescope. It could also be an association of a mass which is in a focal plane with some pupil uh, reducing. Well, pupil with shape. That, well, mask that blocks the pupil in, in a shape that would uh, prevent uh, light from going through where we don't want it, basically. So several techniques, but yeah, most most of them are uh, in the in the focal plane, but o very often associated with uh, some devices in the pupil, which is the image of the primary telescope. Primary okay. of the telescope. Okay, and um, so. Svetlana, now that you're back, I want to see if we can talk about this a little bit because are you there, by the way? Mm -hmm. Yes, you, yes, I'm here. Ah, there you go. Thank you. Sounds you good. were dropping out there and I went ahead right. and, and moved to mod just to, to kind of, but you sound good now. So now we were talking about polarization and how reflected light is polarized and how certain things on a planet is, uh, uh, when you look mm -hmm. at the polarized light through a spectrum, you can you can see what whether it's uh, from life or not. This is this a technique that what we were talking about, this, this animation here? This is the first uh, try. So the first try to reflect, uh, this is a model showing how we can detect reflected light from a planet, which is polarized. So the planet goes around the star and the red sticks showing like a, a, a relative degree of polarization and the orientation of the polarization. This would be, as you explained this, wave oscillates in one direction so that stick shows in which direction the plane basically so we're plane. the observer earth is looking straight into the we, slide we here. are the observers we look at it so okay we are observers so we are going to see the most polarized light at the ends on the left and right parts of the orbits exactly. here right? exactly and that is what is interesting is that a uh, planet doesn't have to transit to see atmosphere so so far most of the detections of the atmospheres were due to tran for transiting planets for, for the transmission spectroscopy. That's right. Yeah. We had to, in order to know that there was an atmosphere at all, we had to measure the spectrum of the light as it shown through the atmosphere of that planet and got to us. And there's lots of problems with that, and you can only do so well. Uh, and it takes a really amazing telescope to do it. And James Webb will do it as well. But uh, yeah. this this technique not only tells you that there is an atmosphere by looking at these, well, wait a minute. Well, I don't see how this tells you an atmosphere. I can see that you could see reflected light off of a planet, but wouldn't it look the same without an atmosphere? You would still no, see it polarized wouldn't. light? No, it wouldn't, because polarization angle will be changing, whether it's reflected from the atmosphere or from the surface, or, or from clouds, or from biosignatures. So this angular dependence and spectral dependence. So you have these two dimensions, as I said. Right. You have spectral dimensions and you have angular dimensions. And that angular dimension tells you what's the property of the surface from which uh, light has reflected. So this is additional information what you get. I see. Okay. All right. So it's that spectral information that really is key. This just well, tells you... Angular. No, no, both. Spectral and angular. Both. <laughs> I don't get what the angle is telling. What does the angle angular um, information tell you? Okay, so this uh, graph only shows scattering from the atmosphere, really scattering basically. Okay. If there would be clouds in the atmosphere, then the sticks will go closer to to the uh, center of that picture. So the sticks moving like this. Yes. Can, this is angular dependence, and plus they can change direction. So when we measure <clears throat> polarization, where the maximum occurs and how it's oriented, we can say which surface is that and which particles are there. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Sorry. And this problem is something that we, nor any uh, that I can think of, maybe you can think of some, Harley, I don't know. Is anybody, any instruments online planning <laughs> on doing anything like this? Do you guys not, know? No, not, no, not that I know of. I was going to ask a question. It looks as though... Um, so this is stretching my my knowledge speculation that uh, and surely you folks or your colleagues have thought about this is that you can also search for seasonal variations. Yes. And uh, diurnal True. daily variations that might be a little bit pushing a little bit further, but 
but uh, variations over the seasons, if it does have seasons. The chlorophyll, for example, would Absolutely be true. Well, we, we had some um, first measurements of this polarized light. We have one planet where we detected this. Uh, it's very diff it's not easy, it's difficult, it requires lots of patience and very accurate measurements and accurate instruments, so lots of calibration. Um, but it's worth it. It's difficult, but it's worth it because you get really uh, one more dimension in your measurement. So concerning the seasons, indeed, if you uh, observe, I mean, if the period of a planet is several hundred days, like on Earth, it's 300 days, yeah? So we have do have seasons, and because of the axis of, of the planet is inclined to the orbit, we we can see those seasons as well. So does you this, can measure... Uh, uh, does this happen to show that, by the way? Or Yeah, we can discuss that. So uh, this is unpolarized light. We, we haven't done yet for polarized light. This is next step. But this is, even when we use unpolarized measurements um, uh, of the Earth. light... Yes, uh, uh, this is like an Earth-like planet with those continents we know, uh, a slightly smeared kind of. This is a so-called albedo map, so this is reflection property map. And uh, on the right, you see the change of the flux, uh, relative brightness, uh, as the planet rotates around the axis and as it goes around the star. So on the previous cartoon, we've seen the phases of the planet going around him. Yeah? And so if we combine this all together and we apply inversion technique, what we call uh, some mathematical um, um, uh, analysis of this data, we can recover a map of the uh, reflectance or albedo, we call it, on the surface, which is shown uh, on the top. And so the, the image on the bottom is the input image, and the image on the top is the output image from, from this uh, simulated data. We don't have yet data to uh, apply it to real observations. This is the hope that with bigger telescopes we can get this data. Well, you, that's, why, that's why you're building the telescopes, right? Yes, so. <laughs> exactly. So ELF will be, a, this exo uh, life finder will be the first one to try that. And but we already developed mathematical technique who, which works, and we tested it on Earth like on Earth uh, kind of maps, you know. Right. Okay. So, so we're getting we're getting some questions on the chat window, and let me just I want to I want to get to them, but let me just let me I, we're running out of time, and I we gosh I can't believe that already <laughs> we're forty five minutes in. So the we've talked about the telescopes. You've you've told us the, you have the planets telescope, which is sort of a pathfinder proof of uh, concept technology telescope which looked pretty darn impressive in its own right it's an off all of these things are off axis telescopes and there's the elf which is the exo life finder which is going to be the next stage or the next step and followed by the now where are we in this building process guys where are we uh, on say planet first telescope and where are they going to be Oh, okay. maybe, uh, my internet probably not good. Maybe Maud can answer. Yeah, okay. it's so, still hard, hard for me, but <laughs> I have okay. trouble uh, hearing you. I think uh, we are a bit distracted. Oh, am I cutting out too? Tony was, yeah, Tony yeah. was breaking up as well. No, he was oh, asking, right. Maud, he was asking, um, uh, what's the status of construction and where are they going to be located? Yeah, where are we in the uh, uh, building? Okay, the planet, so I go. can explain that. So, Planet Telescope, we are now uh, on the st in the station, we are uh, finished in the process of polishing of the primary mirror. We are uh, like second stage of polishing now, first stage was done. Uh, we are in the process of engineering of the building and engineering the telescope. We have uh, all finding and building all this. Uh, and we are in the process of getting permit to finalizing the permit to build it on Haleakala in Hawaii. We are not, oh, really? we don't Haleakala. have officially, okay. we don't have officially permit yet, but we are in the process. So that's okay. our hope. We can be permitted to build there. Wonderful. That'll be a great location. Well, the thing, and if things go smoothly, they, they never do. This is the real world. If things go smoothly. <laughs> Just that's a 30 meter telescope, guys. <laughs> they, oh, yeah. 30 meter yeah. telescope, guys. So what is the, so what's first light expected for it? So we we hope it's end of 2018, uh, mid from mid to end 2018. So about if we, have, if we, if we have secured the funding, yeah. For planets, no, not for the. Right, not so that's for what planets. we're talking about for the planets. Yeah. This is phase one, stage one. The planets. Yes, exactly. 
Okay. Uh, and okay. for health, uh, I mean, we foresee like if if there is a funding uh, uh, as usual that the construction will be around five years. So that in if we have funding right now, uh, uh, we can start construction. So in five years, we'll have it. A couple of years will take engineering, and a, a few three years, something like this construction. Uh, uh, okay. I, and I've got a. I mean, this is these are this is just terrific. Got a question. Um, uh, the um, the number. What is your estimate of the number of optimistically? Be, go ahead, be optimistic. The number of planets that you might be able to detect with Elf. Sure, we we actually calculated that very carefully. Oh yeah. So, <laughs> I know uh, so this is um, uh, at least a dozen. So at least a dozen, you can say. Our primary target will be Proxima. But there are a few, you know, within a few parsecs, there are already a few exoplanets, which we can look. And uh, also, what is interesting, that we can look for, for non-transiting planets with this telescope, because all the missions we know will look at bright stars to look for transits, and all non-transiting planets will be missed. So our, our ELF telescope will allow to look at stars where we don't know there are transiting planets, but there yeah. could be, as we know, there could be some other planets which are not transiting. Yeah. So could be a dozen or more. That's such a great point. I want to say again, when you don't look at when you, when you, these transitive measures, dips in brightness as a, as a planet moves around the star, we can only see those planets that we can do yeah. that between us and that. What Svetlana's saying is now we can detect these things. I think your connection is not good. Can you repeat okay. it? again? <laughs> so let me let me. This one I didn't catch either. So let me ask a, a an obvious question from the purpose of, from uh, a non exoplanet astronomer. Me, I assume that either you have say uh, non exoplanet scientists on your team who would like to use this facility for other astronomical goals. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, and sure. And this is what we call high contrast science. So it's looking yeah, for yeah, yeah. for faint uh, objects next to the bright objects, and right. we we talk about it as well in our uh, consortium that it's not necessarily exoplanets. It can be asteroids, binary asteroids, for instance. You know, in the solar system, you can look at really small things, and uh, in you can look at quasars uh, and and I don't know, look at structure of uh, you don't resolve them, but with you know. I um I don't know what what could be another example um, binary stars. Um, binary stars. Yeah. Like you're, I, mean, I think you're uh, from my own back when I was doing research. Um, the the small scale structure around active galactic nuclei, quasars, and so on is fascinating stuff. Yeah, something yeah, so like that. Yeah, you can do yeah jets also any interaction between right. the stars. What is uh, the limitation? Is the these things need to be fairly bright, and the field of view is fairly restricted for the adaptive optics to work. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, plus, okay. it's kind of, there's not much chlorophyll there either. So, but you know. am I back, guys? Can you hear me? Am well, I back? Yes. Okay, good. So, right. I want to get to some of the comments and questions that we have here because we're running out of time. Uh, I'm on the I'm on the live uh, chat window now, and uh, Galaxia, welcome. Glad you could make it back. She was uh, uh, made a comment about maybe we'll find a different planet further out from Proxima. Um, uh, that leads me to a question that I have for you guys. Um, you're, are you going to be using, when you go to look for life, okay, I'm not talking about detecting other, you're going to be using known catalogs of exoplanets or do you, will you have a target list of things that you want to look, you said Proxima was your first goal. Def definitely Proxima is the first goal. If uh, there will be p planets found that around A and B Centauri, you know, Alpha Centauri, then they are even easier to look. Uh, with bigger telescopes, so <clears throat> sure. Uh, I, but what I want, I said before, is that we don't look only at known planets. We will look at all bright stars. So we did estimates, for instance, in uh, magnitude limited sample of stars. It's three thousand five hundred stars of uh, up to thirteen magnitude uh, of the spectral classes between A and M. So this is A is 10,000 degrees, M is a uh, red dwarf, yeah? So these are the stars which we can look planets for around. And uh, so there's 3,500 stars brighter than 13 magnitude. And uh, mm. so we look at how many we can look. With ELF, we can look at dozen or, or so. Um, 
uh, with uh, Colossus, we can look at all of them. So that's the <laughs> difference, you know? Yes, okay. So George Caldwell is asking, or he's saying, looking for planets in the Goldilocks zone. This is that area where if, a, if an exoplanet is in orbit around a star, the temperatures are such that liquid water could be present if it had any. Uh, and, and he's saying that, it could, that the Goldilocks zone can only take us so far. What else can be used as a technique to try and figure out if a planet may be suitable for life? Uh, for example, is exoplanetary atmospheric analysis possible? And I, and I believe, Svetlana, you said that using this polarization uh, spectra, you can find these things out, right? Yes, yes, of course. You see it in spectra uh, without polarization, but you can also see, you see it in polarized spectra. And with polarization, again, it's an order of the magnitude higher contrast you can achieve. So you can look at fainter, uh, basically, objects uh, with polarization. And uh, so, um, yeah, spectral analysis will tell you composition of the of the atmosphere, spectral and polarized and spectral unpolarized, both. Yeah, maybe, yeah, to add one point, I think these techniques are very useful because it gives you uh, information on the nature of the of the planet and what you're observing, but also it enables you to decorrelate, basically decouple, decouple light from the star, from the light from the the planet itself by the sorting colors or sorting polarization and it is very efficient in increasing the contrast because the behavior is different from the, the star itself okay well um so with the um so with these telescopes that are coming up presumably not i don't think are, is your plan do you think for all of them to be built on haleakala or will we maybe oh no okay no, yeah no. i was gonna say get kind of crowded right there <laughs> <laughs> yes. so, so what well, about we i want to ask about they need some land somewhere <laughs> yeah well one of the reasons haleakala and mauna kea and chile are all yeah. great spots is because they tend to be not only high up where there's less atmosphere but they also tend to be very dry which means there's not a lot of water vapor in the atmosphere uh, but that's useful mostly for the infrared kind of wavelengths. And I'm, because I'm curious, what wavelength range are you guys looking at here? Uh, specific? Is there any one that you prefer over others? Yeah, this uh, uh, depends. I mean, in the if you look for the atmospheres, can be red, infrared, definitely. When you look for biopigments, this is uh, in, on Earth. The biopigments are, are absorb only in the visual. So this is we don't know exactly, but most probably related to the composition of the atmosphere and early Earth, and also to the spectral distribution of the star, energy distribution of a star. So if we go to uh, habitable zones of M dwarfs, let's say, and then the, all the flux is shifted to the infrared. And if there is life there and use uh, photo, kind of photosynthetic uh, um, photosynthesis for production of, uh, uh, to uh, produce these chemicals, you know, and store the energy, in the organism, then most probably this all uh, absorption band, what we see in optical on the earth will be shifted to the red. So we have to search. We cannot say uh, for sure where we have to search, but it has to be point. from but, optical to the infrared. But that's a good point. But but some stars are probably more likely, don't you think, to harbor life than others. For example, yeah. I know a lot of astrobiologists are excited about these red dwarf stars. And not so much with, uh, say, blue supergiants or some of the stars that only live for a few hundred million years. Uh, exactly. Right. For no other reason, then it takes you know life a little bit of time to get started, right? So, uh, and these really high high temperature blue mass blue supergiant stars, maybe not so much. So, it, it, that would kind of help you guide your wavelength ranges a little bit, right? If I mean, yes, exactly. So, yeah. Yeah. So I mean, the so let me okay speculation time, guys. Okay, so I know okay. I know I that, that this <laughs> what I'm about to ask a loaded question, but I, I want to know what you think. I mean, I, I, five years ago, we did not know that there were more planets than stars in the sky. Twenty years ago, we didn't even know there were planets around other stars. What is your hunt? Well, we expected them. Okay. <laughs> well, okay, but okay, well, fine. Let's say then that, that that makes my question even better. What do you think? What's your expectation here on finding life? Do you think it's common? Do you think it's, you, are you thinking we're going to find it all over the place? So what do you think? Just, I know it's an opinion. I know we don't know any, have any data yet, but give me your <laughs> yeah. thoughts. And Svetlana, well, I'll start I with you. I think life is everywhere. I just, I believe in this. Look, on Earth, there's no place where there is no life. Life is such a form of matter. It's kind of aggressive. It fits everywhere. 
So once you bring that a couple of microbes on Mars, they will find the place and they'll colonize the whole planet. So <laughs> well <said. laughs> I'm thinking that life is everywhere. Advanced life, you know, some people think life is advanced life, civilizations and so on. That might be rare. Maybe not. This is hard to say. But any kind of a form of life can be anywhere. So we just, it's like planets. We didn't know where to look, mm -hmm. but once we found first one, we knew how to find, where to look for, and we found so many. Maybe there will be, in, in 10 years, we'll say, well, there is more life in the universe than we could ever imagine. Well, okay, so Maude, do you have an opinion, or do you want to you chime in? No, it's about the same thing. I think uh, it's, we don't know exactly how, what kind of form it would be and where to look for it, but it's once we get it, uh, we will uh, know better. It's like exactly the planet. We, we didn't know they were there before, and now we, are, we see so many. What about you, Harley? You got any ideas on? You got any, th any thoughts? This I, is tough. We're talking to two experts there, so I, I'll just defer to. The two well, you got to have an opinion, okay? You got to. You got to have. <laughs> I'm not elegant. Kind of my opinion is I'm more. I'm optimistic, but more cautiously optimistic. I think life is more rare than um, I'm. I I rather like some of the the skeptics about about how how. Um, prevalent life may be so a little bit less optimistic well, but I certainly I, think it, it it's outside there there is li there are life bearing planets beyond our solar system well I I've, I've said this many times in my videos if life on earth is any guide and why shouldn't it be uh, then if life if, you know if life does exist I, I agree with both Maude and, and Svetlana then it is everywhere uh, because once it takes hold it's pretty tenacious and it's hard to kill it off now, it's advanced hard, life, yeah. that's a different conversation, but that's not what you're looking for here. You're looking for life at all, and that is, and to me, one of the most important questions we've ever asked as, as human in, in the history of human beings. And so I'm glad you guys are out there uh, trying to answer these questions. And guys, we are out of time. It's already been an hour, okay. and I, I have <laughs> I have a lot more I want to... We also, I want to say, we okay. also search for civilizations with Colossus. Once we have a Colossus, we can find civilizations. We have a technique also on that. Okay, but hold that thought, because that's, the, that's the subject of another Hangout, because I want to yes. go into that a lot more. That's a okay. great point. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, folks, uh, I want to thank my guests, uh, Dr. Svetlana uh, Ber Berdugana and uh, Dr. Maude uh, Langlois from uh, the University of Lyon and from Ka Kuypenheimer, the Ka Kuypenheimer Institute for Solar Physics. I want to thank you both for taking time out to tell us about the Planets Foundation. Go to their website. The link is in the description box, planets.life. They have a Patreon campaign where you can get involved uh, yourselves and help them out. It's a great thing. This is this is a whole different ballgame, folks. We're not talking about tests. We're not talking about W first, James Webb Space Telescope. We're talking about life in the universe. And uh, I can't wait to see what these guys can do. It's, it looks like the Planets Telescope is online for late 2018. That's about, that's a big time because that's also when JWST is going to launch. So hopefully uh, we'll be able to see this get, get done as well. Harley. Thank you for another hangout. This has been, we've got another one on the show. Yeah, yeah. We, I want to let you guys know. Yeah, we, yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh, hi, what's that? Oh, yeah, I love what, that. What are the chances of finding, finding This is our ducks. LIGO rubber duck. This is yellow life in the universe. Life. Yeah. Yellow yeah. life, that's right. <laughs> LIGO, LIGO. That's right, program in your, your spectrum, uh, your, 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 polar, your polarization spectrum for that. Of I, I, can say I want to know how many rubber ducks there are in the universe. Yeah, so that's, we've got one of my cats behind me. Yeah, we have a black life over there. So. <laughs> Thanks for the tips. That's a house panther. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Well, folks, we are taking off next week because of the Thanksgiving holiday. We won't be back, but I believe after that, we've got a Footsteps to Mars hangout coming up, right, Harley? We're deciding we on what that's going to be yeah, coming yeah, up. Yeah, we're looking at, uh, we're looking at um, ISRU in situ resource utilization on Mars, using the materials of Mars to extend our uh, human exploration of Mars. Wow. All right. That's well, very that's exciting. so stay tuned wow. for us. I want to thank everybody watch. for for <laughs> watching. Uh, I want to and uh, I want to also mention that these hangouts are sponsored or are endorsed by the American Astronomical Society and the American Astronautical Society. And thanks again to our guests from the uh, Planets the, the Planets Foundation. Thank you all for watching. And as thank always, you. thanks to you as well. That's right. And keep, that uh, and as always, keep, keep looking, looking up. up. <laughs> yes. Keep looking.